history that you discussions that are very much connected to the discussion that we have now. And we would like to spend a slightly shorter than length discussion to continue a little bit about the big picture of the bigger plans and what we get so far. And so what we'd like to do in this perhaps short half hour is go back to one of the early slides this morning, the session that we have sort of discussed in the general setting. And so really it's about some things that we should just apply and motivate, uh, perhaps in the geomath instances or other possibilities that our discussion might be tomorrow in the future or what's beyond CNG. And really, in the context of how the machine science at large and generally mathematics and statistics, mathematics is the science of what we just apply say a semester program that is an instrument to a much larger effort than perhaps we have done in the in the world of geomathematics and statistics programs. And so to come back to the subjects that uh, set you away from that, perhaps the world of discussion by no means a complete set of things, but this is the start of the discussion. Um, we have sort of divided into understanding of statistics, and it's essentially development and validity of theoretical models and mathematical foundations. And we heard all about both the scale and the stochastic version of the mystic or similar in between. The second theme, the common theme that will certainly address today and will be addressed uh, tomorrow, computation, processing of systems, uh, think of it as sort of a digital laboratory. Uh, items like accuracy, stability, scalability, uh, solver support, in fact, solver support. Has to do with very large systems, completely new computer architectures. Then characterization, inverse problems at large, characterization, uh, very tight to uncertainty quantification, data requirements. Should we look for a common data model, model diffusion? Maybe we cannot diffuse the What are the possibilities here? Those subjects all, I think, highlight that the mathematical and statistical challenges become very Believe that is true for and then a lot of discussion today about the predicting evolution of those systems. And certainly that quantification mechanisms, complex goals, virtual orientation, using basic goals, and many other things. So here are a few things on the table, and we really want to try to stimulate the discussion you know, on a more abstract level. What would be sort of the, the challenges for the mathematical statistics from the geoscience side? That, that we go into a white paper uh, or a huge problem, whatever the problem will be simple, uh, here's a hat of facts, and perhaps I can say a few words to the statistics side. Um, I don't know if I understand what you've done at all. I mean, I think it is important for us to actually, I mean, we've been trying to talk about the geological problems, I think it's important to talk a little bit more about the mathematical statistical side of things. This is a workshop funded by, by the international. So we want to say what are the interesting mathematical questions that arise at more site like conditions as opposed to here's the geological problems of the 50 elements just talking about the conditions more the problems we solve. And I'm sure that's not we know that's not the case. But, but I think we also want to talk about how how where we're going to bring fields together. We want to think about the synergies in both directions. How, how each of you will lead to, to, to things that would be interesting within that field that couldn't have happened without, without that interaction. Um, I mean, there's some of the other things that occur to me a little bit that, that seem to have been kind of things that have come up in, in a lot of what we've heard about, uh, just getting the rare events, uh, both from statistical and in other perspectives. Um, uh, yeah, this, I mean, this, this, this discussion about forecasting and you know, versus prediction, I mean, I think time scales of, of predictions are really important. It seems to be for earthquake forecasting. If you could forecast any earthquakes even five seconds in advance, that would now have practical implications in terms of having automated systems to have them shut down gracefully, shut down nuclear power plants gracefully rather than not so gracefully. So, 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 you know, that would, I mean, 20 years ago, someone would say, well, there's no point in the Earthquake five seconds in advance, but now, now there's maybe even a point of being able to make an earthquake two 
quantification has become a buzzword, or two buzzwords. And, uh, you know, there's been a committee of the NRC looking into this and so on. The fundamental mathematical question, which has been sort of hinted at here, is a map, is model of robustness. You know, that various concepts of model of robustness, the structural stability, the stochastic structural stability, the statistical stability, you know, all of these refer to certain properties of models that we would like to trust. Okay? And I would even extend this, I hinted to this, this already here earlier this morning, that we would like to know this not just about a single model, but about families of models with interest. Okay? And, uh, you know, I don't really know that, uh, that there is such a mathematical theory now, you know, proper generalization of what happens to a model to a full class. So that's something that, you know, putting on my other hat, <laughs> say, might be exciting. Yes, I, I have a question. So I have something like that. What I don't understand is what you would characterize as a success. Because I'll give you an example of what I would. So finite elements is a success because mathematicians brought it up, but I heard it mentioned by the open system more than one presentation because they can use it and don't have it. Um, but if you're talking about, okay, we have a theory, but how is it actually going to impact the way that people do geophysics? I can't understand that from the smallest one. So what would be useful to me is to understand how you think that this theory would really impact the way that people would do you. Well, I'm terribly sorry that you know my talk was placed tomorrow. <laughs> because it will answer your question. But basically, you know, um, you don't trust uh, uh, sort of uh, legal straight models to give you a prediction. I mean, the even people here who claim, you know, predictions utterly impossible. Uh, that's because you know, we don't know the laws, we don't know the physics, we don't know anything. Okay, I, I don't share that from you, but I can tell you that in climate, you know, where presumably uh, we quote unquote know the government equations, you know, and, and all that, uh, people have been working very hard now for 20 years, you know, hundreds and hundreds of to get an estimate of warming and other phenomena dependent on the 
that will be sufficiently reliable so as to convince policymakers and the electorate and so on that something is urgent, okay? And they have publicly failed. But I would say that's, uh, that framing is asking scientists to do the, to answer the wrong question because, because in order to develop a sense, in order for policymakers to have a reason to ask, to act, we don't need small uncertainty. Because if we have uncertainty and there's a non-zero or a significant probability that the climate sensitivity is high, that actually gives you more reason to act. And so I would say the target of uncertainty quantification is, is more important. In other words, knowing whether, given our prior, our knowledge at present, uh, there is a chance uh, that, the, that the climate sensitivity is four degrees per doubling. That, that gives policymakers pause to act. Or it should, because that's how decisions are made in every other policy framework. You don't demand certainty. And I don't think we're going to get certainty. I, you know, as you know, I fully agree with the fact that the air bars are such that it's going to keep warming. Uh, reasonable people agree on that. But the fact that you really have very little knowledge about how aminos are going to change in this world, or hurricanes, or various other things that really affect people. You know, basically, nobody really gives a damn about what the global mean temperatures are. Okay? Uh, what they are really interested in are you know, how things will work out on some small scale, and, and so on. So the fact that these models, which give you air bars that are above zero, is not real enough. You know, and the fact that no model uh, really doesn't tell you the drop of the monsoon and you know, all these other things, and that uh, they agree with each other more than with nature, on the other hand, they also disagree dramatically, um, is not something that uh, is comfortable. And it's not comfortable for me as a scientist. And it's certainly not comfortable for, for uh, policy makers. Yeah, except those problems are not going to be solved anytime in the next 50 years. I'm quite confident in making no. that prediction. Yeah, but, but, but the decisions that, that <laughs> decision, decision the policymakers need to make have to have, you know, they have to happen really soon. And so the thing we can contribute on a time scale that actually helps make the decisions is understanding what are the risks given our present knowledge. Uh, what are the risks that El Nino does something, you know, what are the what has to happen for El Nino to do something really bad or what has to happen for the climate sensitivity to be on the high end. That that's the sort of thing where we realistically could make a contribution. Uh, I, I don't think any we're not, the biggest source of uncertainty in, in climate sensitivity is clouds, uh, and uh, I, there's, there's just not much chance that uh, our error bars are going to narrow very much on that on a time scale. Uh, well, that, just that's why I said, that's why I said that that's not the first, but I don't mind putting it down there. Put uncertainty for communication. Yeah, that's already on the other Not for you. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I think that the point of the not the side of all of this. Uh, without much of the developments in numerics, for example, we can have a uh, calculus out of the numerics.
about how to deal with systems with many different timescales. One of the things that holds up the uh, investigation of long-range climate uh, variations, I mean thousands of years, is that uh, the ocean has a slow time scale, so that forces, but the atmosphere has a fast time scale. Glaciers have an even slower time scale than the ocean. Uh, but ocean atmosphere models have to be integrated uh, over the time scale it takes for the ocean to equilibrate. And that, and it's the atmosphere model, which has a fast time scale that actually burns up all the computer time in this. Now, you would think that you could do this sort of asynchronously with, and you do use different time steps in the ocean and in the atmosphere, but uh, but accelerating the convergence uh, has not really been achieved. Every sort of attempt to accelerate the convergence of the deep ocean, it's it's sort of foundered on some numerical instability. I mean, it's not generally done, except in a very ad hoc way. And so. So finding uh, ways to actually make this work. Uh, I guess I wanted to say between the between and the 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 even if you uh, if you uh, just concentrate on the part of the equations that we know very well, you know, eliminate you know, 
questions about uh, about uh, small scale mixing in the ocean and tidal mixing and things like that. Yeah, even even restricting attention to the part of the page we really know, uh, handling this multiple time step, this multiple time scale problem in an elegant way is not uh, achieved. What, what do they do? They just brute force. They just don't. Yeah. That's not even alert. They 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 publish on this. Did they do like alert and multi time step and or anything? Do people yeah. claim it worked and it didn't work, or they didn't try? That. Well, uh, actually, uh, there may be technology out there that's not been transferred into ocean atmosphere modeling. But, uh, so I've never heard of Galerkin time stepping being used in atmosphere ocean modeling. Um, it's much, much more ad hoc homebrew attempts. But I mean, for sure, company. the work that's been done to try to accelerate convergence of the ocean is exactly yeah. the problem that you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, the, the acceleration techniques always fail to conserve energy, which is we, we yeah. would normally agree was a very bad thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, often the problem comes in also at the interface where you have some fast component in the ocean, like sea ice, that is, is hard, and, and it's very hard to build energy conservation into those sort of things. And by the way, the exact same problem comes up in planetary atmosphere modeling for uh, the optically thick atmospheres like Venus, where the top of the atmosphere has a very short time scale. But the deep atmosphere responds even more slowly than the ocean. But Venus modelers are sort of forced to model to integrate their whole system with the same uh, time step, very time consuming. Yeah. So just just on the issue, there's two related things. So <coughs> a multi-rate integration is one aspect of this sort of operating composition of these multi physics systems, but it comes up in many ways just because you have different resolutions. You may have different methods for the different you know, Processes typically different codes if you're coupling ocean to atmosphere. For yeah. Stacking the equations, this again is another kind of decomposition. And all of these things unfortunately have the fact that you may resolve each piece, but the whole thing is still wrong. So there's quite a bit of work in this, and it's, there's no easy solution to it. It's just something that should be examined because typically what people, at least I work a lot with multi physics people, they tend to think that the numerics are under control. And that's certainly not. So you're building models with things that often be errors. That's one thing. The other, a couple other things about this is that at least with the codes I use, or I've been exposed to, there's a lot of uh, choices made inside the code. You couldn't even say it's this discretization of these equations. There's a lot of if statements, and all of this, of course, is going to put in instability in these threshold events and so on. They may be completely just because a graduate student did something at one point that's easier to do with this statement than it is to sort of blend models or something else they should have done. That's just the reality of codes. And then the third thing is, is that I, it, I, the discussion is very complicated for me because I often see people that, based on the discretization resolution, will change the equations. They say at this level, at this, at this resolution, we know we need a finer detail model. We need a cloud design model. We need some other effect. There's some parameterizations they typically use for processes that and those parameterizations will depend on the discretization. So it isn't even like a convergence study would do because if you try to resolve the mesh, you'll actually be changing the equations. And this is done all over the place, at least in the codes I have. And I, there's nothing wrong with that, but this is all something that has to be examined. So I think just think numerical, you know, sort of numeric, sort of more sophisticated numerical control, numerical error. And, that estimation of numerical error and so on. Yeah, correct. Well, there's a specific problem which I think is about the critical of many of the things that have been done in geophysics, um, which is an intersection of math physics and physics. And that's phase transitions and they're coupling with the uh, physics of instant transitions. Exactly, that's the problem that needs to 
process is really critical. I think it's it's in the work of the project is what you say, the work of physics problems. This is an amazing example of that also at the every stage of the project. So we lost touch with the PDE formulation. Decided yeah, sorry, that what was it? A discrete? Discrete wormhole. So they didn't call it that. <laughs> but it, the problem was there was not enough over, well, overflowing of deep water in the uh, Denmark Strait, so between the ice and the Greenland. There's like one or two elements on their mesh there. And the solution was to pick one of those elements and say, this one is permeable bedrock and pick another one a few elements over and say the water that flows into one gets injected into the other. Fixed mesh, turn the knob, maybe you get the right amount of flow. But this was the annual achievement of this. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> we, we've lost a touch with any concept of convergence or the PD industrialization. Uh, and yeah, I'll just turn that, it's not as bad as it sounds. I mean, there have been yeah, for years, there actually have been proposals of dealing with uh, essentially that sub grid scale uh, flow problem there by uh, uh, looking at uh, hydraulic uh, control of flow. And so, essentially, you're taking, you're replacing the real with a simple model of a kind of a flow over a ridge that you can solve analytically. And so, you, you just put in a flux from one place to another. They have to have described it in a rather peculiar way. But it's not so terribly different from what you do when you're parameterizing clouds. Actually, now we're currently limiting the public. I mean, this is not a question that will get the mathematician excited. Yeah, this is an issue about whether it's we know the equations, we just can't solve them, or we don't know the equations. Nearly always, we don't know the equations. I mean, we know the Navier Stokes equations, but we are so, so far, we are so far from resolving those. Now, is it not the correct equations at all? So, I mean, even in the ocean, we have, the ocean is kind of slow, but it has fast times together also, and we're interested in the slow components. So, how do we figure out what the effects of the fast part are on the slow parts? I mean, that becomes a problem of turbulence. So many of these things become problems of scale interactions. To me, that's where the problem lies. I just wanted to offer something for the statistician. So the equivalent problem of the multi-physics, multi-scale problem, which is renormalization group problem, is called marginalization of statistics. So a nice problem that I'd like to see statisticians working on, not a statistician, is to find fast methods to use small scales to marginalize uh, probabilities or, or, or samples and be able to, to, to talk between scales. I mean, it's a challenge, and it's just as challenging as a multi-scale problem to the But it's a, it's a, it's a, it would be a very useful thing for statisticians, too. What I mean is the statistics of the, of the small scale, of the atomistic world, and that of the large scale are not necessarily the same. And one doesn't know exactly how one marginalizes probabilities, go backward and forward. And if we're thinking in terms of multi scales and samples and this and that, that's a huge, yeah. huge. Yeah. Difference. The scale issue, the scale issue is all the time. And you know, just the basic things of comparing the observations. Like, even folks will write, they will like be with you, but it's not better than the same thing. So you have to have some way of trying to say, you know, there's a way of putting it, you can say about what the model can think about. How 
But the, even there's some technological things. I mean, the, the only thing I know how to use to, to use is the Gibbs sampler is about the only thing I can imagine using if I want to marginalize something. So, you know, if, if someone came up with better and faster ways, so I'm just simply putting that in as one of the a research topic that would be very useful in a variety of geoscience applications. And I'm not saying that it's a solution, I mean, but, but it's, it's, it would be fruitful and it would be work, work very nicely with people who are interested in multi-skill, multi-physics problems. Yeah. I think that there was a comment coming about that sort of referring to climate models as sort of not looking like I, I think that that's actually the you know, wrong attitude here. I think that if you talk to a climate model, or what, what they would say is that the models are inspired by the means of other physics, but really what they implement is simply a dynamic system. It's both discrete in time and space. And it's actually a challenge to mathematics to actually figure out what, what, what they're doing and trying to find a, a framework to put it in. Um, these, these models in, in, in many um, processes work, work fine at, at large scales. And so I think there's a, there's a lot of unsolved mathematics here to um, the, 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 the point about the Denmark Strait, um, that's, that's simply physical modeling. I mean, that's, um, it's, it's not a PD, it's, it's being bound by the kind of resolution you have on the answer, which is not big. Yeah, to, to follow up on that PDE versus uh, stochastic or discrete models is essentially even for things that you know, ultimately are described by PDEs on small scales like sand sand piles and things. But the real issue is that they're very simple systems where you can show that the coarse grain system is not described by any PDE. And in those cases, often the 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 uh, the, the, uh, uh, the quickest route to getting a representation is through some kind of stochastic model, and and that could well be the case for sea ice. Sea ice actually having granular medium models of sea ice in, in two dimensions, and uh, and it, it is a very promising way way to represent force grade stuff. But among other things, how you analyze models like that once you've formulated them. Because it's one thing, you know, formulating models good, but you want to do more than just do a lot of simulation. You want to have some language to describe, to understand what's happening. We have that for ODEs, and to some extent for PDEs, but we don't have that to the same extent for so these kind of models. Yeah. So back in the golden age of turbulence models, there was this uh, there were a bunch of controlled models, and there wasn't a initially great pressure to distinguish between error committed by a numerical model uh, that implemented a given continuum of turbulence model and the error committed by the turbulence model. And around the mid '80s, uh, the community made fairly clear that we had to start making this distinction in order to understand what was going on with these turbulence. So we, if you look at, say, the 1986 editorial policy for general fluid engineering, they have a, a very nice discussion of this. Uh, and they specify that we have to, you know, as a professional matter, we have to distinguish between the numerical error uh, and the continuum error. Otherwise, we don't understand the process. And I think that's very true here. So if we have some big model and we don't have a way to distinguish between uh, the discrete things that we might be doing versus, uh, say, just numerical artifacts, then we're really not understanding the process. I agree. Yeah. Right. What I love about this, I mean, at some point, like 15 years ago, my, my company, my company, my company, my company,
So the geoscientist basically looking more data than mathematician and looking more equations. So that the data now as a key, we have many observations, many data. So for example, NASA have one satellite, it's a surrounding the Earth, for all of the day. The data can be a huge every center, have a data center. But all of us in trying to use this, those data is not that convenient. So Google have invent some way to search for something. For example, if I want to find Michael Gale, I can hear the find I even can know, you know how old it is, <laughs> how many publications it, it, it has. But should the mathematician develop a way such that all the geoscientists, all the mathematicians can get a data easy. So you can, if I want to verify my model, I can find what data I want. I can go get there from we, you know, doesn't matter which center or which country, but some people have to be like the city environment, so you can get it. So that, that's something that you know, should be developed for the community, maybe for the. I think this is the one of the interesting questions when you pass the data, very high dimensional. How can you, without looking at all the data, analyze and find? Outliers, changes, and so forth. So how can you actually look into those structures where things are different from more general structures? You know, those are those are mathematical developments that take place. Sure, have absolutely no sure yet, and very well connected with those questions. There's something we should uh, should uh, focus on that is that uh, you know if I know how to develop how to do that. It's not a challenging problem anymore. So that's why it's challenging. Why it's probably the math of computer science is the part of the NSF. I agree that it's really important. The argument of DMS is important. It might be a whole other level of people do. So you're working on something that you can one day and look at and then try to see how well I'm doing and they don't know what to do. So it's a big problem. Well, but I don't know if that's a really good idea to have the data. I think that if you want the data, you have to collaborate with the data. It's not just a we will make, make it easier because you know the, 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 the people's life is there. That's the way to do it. I'm not saying you know you can solve it right away. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to come back to this thing about statistics that sort of Juan was, was raising. See, I mean, uh, there is also a gap in communication between statisticians and mathematicians or other kinds of mathematicians. In terms of, you know, uh, the simplest thing is that statisticians will say this, you know, EOF, the Centralized Orthogonal Function, explains this percent of the data. I always tell my students it doesn't explain the damn thing. It describes explanation comes from dynamics. You know, there is, I think, in statistics, there is a, when I talk to very sophisticated statisticians, there's a certain lack of understanding of dynamics. You know, uh, there is something about data being either time series or spatial fields. You know, there isn't a lot, at least not work that I'm aware of, on things of spatial temporal patterns, you know, on 
using real dynamics as priors in the in the Bayesian. Well, I think you said that 20 years ago. Right. 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 And not not the scientists in the statisticians that are in the session, a lot of knowledge that are working in the way Yeah, that, 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 that's the point. Yeah, that's the point. I think we uh, have a couple more comments and then we slowly wrap up the questions at dinner. That, that, uh, I'd like to uh, suggest that the third bullet there, the third non-bullet there, uh, be brought um, for the following reason. There's a revolution that's, that's undergoing, that's uh, happening right now in computer architecture. And uh, just announced last week, 10 petabots will be the largest, built today, the largest system in the world, that's hosted by the University of Texas. And this is a machine that gets 8% of its pops from Intel's in many integrated something like GPU. So we're transitioning into these, into these processors that have hundreds of models. Uh, and the mainstream of data science models are the environmental potential equations, which are disinterested to express vacancies, which map horribly on systems that have hundreds of cores, uh, simply because the, uh, the amount of plots that are uh, done as far as I guess operations are not enough to amortize the whole data. Uh, and this is a huge premium on, on mathematics to come up with not just new algorithms, but new discretizations that are higher order discretizations, so richer than possible. And not just new discretizations, you can do models themselves, they in integral equations when those are used in. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost it's widely accepted you know, industry and you know, vendors uh, uh, and computer you know, science, all this computer science issue, computer science. Issue. They can only do, they can give them a code, the lot of points, and they'll report it. But they're not going to go deep into the guts and redefine the algorithms and visualizations and models. Uh, and this is a huge area for five Now, it sounds kind of prosaic, you know, kind of full level. But it's a huge issue. But it's a huge issue. Uh, and it's a big one. It's a little complicated. It's a huge issue. 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 In approximation theory, genus like optimal and conservative, but it's thinking about the genes in the next close version. So you heard. There's a deep and nothing challenges of the line in those states. I think it's like a long board of CDS. Come on, you want to add something to it? Okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, one thing, we've had a Put down on there is the point that Carrie Emanuel made about simple models, which I very agree, much agree with. Also, that that uh, a lot of climate science, in particular, and I think a lot of earth science, has tended to gravitate towards the biggest, most computational model. But a lot of the real intellectual innovation is in the what we sometimes call the toy models, yeah. learning how to formulate yeah. toy models by climate. That's what meant by what? That's what meant by what? That's what meant by what? I fully agree. Yeah. But, but the other half of that is what tools can we bring to bear on the analysis of the behavior of these simple models? A lot of our basic toolkit is essentially early 20th century mathematics, and uh, we have not yet learned how to bring to bear the full power of you know, the 20th and 21st century to these problems. So, that's a very important point. Seth, maybe you want to say, I'm a horse. Yeah. I, want to, as I was thinking as a final word, here's something that you might want to think about. And if, with market here, it's easy to think of this. It's that the area I, I think, and maybe you just want to know more about this, that we've been the most successful at sort of running math and geoscience in parallel, and really driving advances in geoscience with advances in math, is imaging. I mean, that is the one we really are. I mean, if you go back to where we were 20 or 30 years ago, we made an enormous problem. And, and there was an interesting question to ask is why that's why that's true. We have a number of people here. Imaging, imaging, imaging. 
want. The imaging here is what I think of it, because it applies to the tomography. And tomography, broadly, as being one sub, sub piece of that tomography migration, um, a whole class of these things. Now, obviously, you could say at some level that's because imaging is so useful in so many branches of human endeavor, but in a lot of cases, geoscience has been a driver behind that. And what I don't know, but I think it's a good thing that we should take around, is you know, there's something where we really did find something where, by sheer coincidence, where mathematicians have been really interested in the problem, geoscientists have been interested in the problem, of course, medical people have, um, <coughs> kinds of other people too. And it's interesting to see what's the common, is there, I mean, what can we learn from this really successful example here? Is that money? Brilliant insight, but I'm <laughs> hoping that there are several people that are, really, that are really experts on that topic. We've heard from a couple already, and we'll hear this more tomorrow. Maybe that's something we can kind of keep in the back of our heads. Yes. That's just, uh, it's just very important. And happy to talk a little more about my point of view. I take on this. And I will try to get you a summer word. Let me go.